Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about the anti-LGBTQ violence that happens in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico has been, unfortunately, last year it was the epicenter of anti-trans violence in the whole United States and Puerto Rico and the territories. Unfortunately, seven members of our trans community were murdered last year. And um, there were two trans men and five trans women who were killed, uh, unfortunately, last year. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens because we have political and religious leaders who are fundamentalists, who have a hateful rhetoric that incite the violence against our people. And uh, when you have a leader who gives you permission to discriminate or to think that other people are less than, then the violence occurs. Puerto Rico had been on a downward, a downward spiral in more or less 2015, 2016. Hate crimes were going down. And it, it didn't happen also in a vacuum. It happened because the LGBTQ community was organizing and we uh, passed legislation in Puerto Rico uh, to uh, prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity and to include LGBTQ people in the gender violence uh, protection laws in Puerto Rico. It was an amazing battle that Comité Amplio para la Busca de la Equidad CABE, which uh, Amaris and I are members, was formed. And uh, when you see that the community is organizer, then the level of hate comes down because they see that we are empowered and we're doing the right thing. The thing is that hate comes back. It's like a cycle. And when you have political and religious leaders that uh, are like Trump and in Puerto Rico Proyecto Dignidad and others like Tomás Rivera Chatz, and I can, I can mention a lot of uh, political from both parties, from both major parties, because there are all also popular uh, Democratic Party politicians who are homophobic and have voted against our rights, like uh, I can say uh, Angel Rodriguez, and I can mention uh, a lot of them. I can mention a, a long list, I'm not gonna go into that, but when you have political leaders and religious leaders who spout up a hateful rhetoric against us, and, and it comes back again. So Proyecto de Unidad was formed in the last uh, election, and two legislators from that political party were elected. So what do we see when the campaign started in 2019 to now to 2021, because our elections were last year, is that the hate comes back again because those, uh, they have been, uh, the, the Proyecto Dignidad Legislator has have been uh, trying to put legislation, anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in the, in the assembly right now, and they're trying to take away the rights that we gain. So when you see that permission again from the political and religious leaders, what do you see? The violence goes back again. And when you have uh, uh, people who are in the media, like Cobo Santa Rosa that also uh, spouts violence against us and is racist and xenophobic and misogynist and homophobic and transphobic, then it goes back again, it goes back up. So we have a hate crimes law in place in 2002. We were one of the first jurisdictions in the US and the territories to have a hate crimes law that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And we're very proud of that, that, that struggle. Uh, actually, the Dominican Committee was very uh, uh, powerful when we got that, that uh, law passed in 2002. Uh, Puerto Rico is number 20 out of 56 states and territories in terms of legislation and rights for LGBTQ people. So contrary to the myth that Puerto Rico is more homophobic and transphobic than other parts in the U.S., Puerto Rico is number 20 out of 56. And we, as, as I mentioned, the things that are bad from, from Puerto Rico and the violence that we suffer, we also have to uh, celebrate the victories and the, the position that we have in terms of we, what we have achieved. And this is not an easy thing to do. Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rican LGBTQ plus movement has been a mostly volunteer based uh, movement in Puerto Rico. We do, we have, now we have some paid staff, and now we have some organizations that, that have professional uh, people that are paid to do the work. But Puerto Rico, for the most time of our struggle, we have done it in a volunteer basis. And, and that's amazing to achieve.
you know? So we have to celebrate that victory. The Puerto Rican LGBTQ movement has been mostly most uh, women-led. I'm one of the, the fortunate men that are in, in, the, in the struggle. It has been mostly led by women, and we have to celebrate that as well. But at the same time, it's part of the patriarchy and how we give all the, all the work and all the things that have to be done and, and the courage to be done to women. We do that. And I say it as a gay man and as a gay cis man, I say, you know, that is wrong and we need to fix it. We need to step up and we need to do the right thing and not leave everything to women. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying also that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm very proud to be in, 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 in collaboration with women who have been leaders and have been there. So I, I stand alongside them. I'm very, very proud of that. So uh, last uh, this year, we were very uh, fortunate that uh, uh, I hope we didn't have to pass this, but in the past legislature, we passed a law that it was signed to law by Governor Pedro Peruisi to include feminicides and trans feminicides as a, as a, a delitos, a, how you say as, as uh, in the penal code. So we, in a, I don't know, it's going to be a first degree murder when when a, a woman is killed or a trans woman is killed. So uh, that's that's another achievement that we have uh, is that we included that. So we're we're very proud. And Joan maybe can can mention that because the governor signed that into law. Uh, but it, it, it got a, it got a. a a bipartisan uh, approval or multi-partisan because now we're not a big bipartisan system so that's great uh, so then uh, i just want to talk very briefly about uh, what we have seen with the police department and the justice department here in puerto rico and how we have tried to fix things but things keep going back to the same we have done trainings with police, uh, uh, with the police, and we have done trainings with the Justice Department, and we thought that we had trained them enough to be sure to uh, make sure to address uh, hate crimes, uh, violence in Puerto Rico. But uh, we go back to the same thing. We, last year we had Alexa murdered, who was a trans woman, who was a trans homeless woman, uh, who, uh, who after a, a lot of years of hateful rhetoric of trans, uh, of political and religious fundamentalist leaders saying that trans people that go into the bathroom are perverts and they're going after women because they're men dressed in women's clothes and they're going to the bathroom to, to uh, sexually assault women, then that happened. Alexa, a transgender woman who was homeless, went to a bathroom in a fast food restaurant. They put her photo on social media. They said she was a pervert and they tracked her. They hunted her and they posted pictures of everywhere she went. She, I saw her at the gas station. I saw her at the supermarket. I saw her, and then 24 hours after, less than 24 hours after she was posted on social media and accused falsely of being a pervert, she was murdered. But she wasn't only murdered, they videotaped her murder and while they were shouting transphobic slurs against her. And that's the price that we have to pay when that rhetoric becomes action. When you have a political and religious leader saying that they're perverts, then people act on that rhetoric and they act on it and they accuse you and they hunt you and they kill you and they post you on social media so that they can give us a lesson that we know we have to know our place. That is our place. We cannot go into the bathroom to do what everybody does as a basic necessity. That is that you have to go to the bathroom like anyone else. And I do, and I say this with a lot of uh, heart break because it's, it's horrible that, you know, words have meaning. Words have meaning and they translate into actions, hateful actions, violence against our people. So uh, with that, I want to close because I want to open it up, of, of course, and to hear about Joanne. But I wanted to mention Alexa's case because Alexa, as for his Steven Lopez Mercado in 2009, shook the conscience of Puerto Rico and made, made us realize that homophobia kills. In, when Alexa was murdered, we knew that transphobia also kills. And uh, we are better than that. I know that Puerto Rico is a welcoming, loving a place that, you know, can be a better place. But unfortunately, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, 
and the hateful actions of a very few can have a huge impact in the lives of women, of LGBTQ people, and especially our trans brothers and sisters. And we need to step up and end this violence because Puerto Rico is much, much better than that. So I'll leave it at that and now, but I'll, I'll, with the questions I'll, I'll also answer. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly introduce, we have been joined by Johanna Vélez Garcia. She is the Vice Chair of the Democratic Party of Puerto Rico. For more than 25 years, Johanna has been an advocate for women and LGBTQ rights. In 2016, she was the first openly lesbian woman to run for elected office in Puerto Rico. She later became the president of the first ever Governor's Advisory Council on LGBTQ Affairs in Puerto Rico. Joanne currently serves on the Committee for the Prevention, Support, Rescue, and Education of Gender-Based Violence, Community Pare, the Pare Committee, which was recently created after Puerto Rico declared a state of emergency due to gender-based violence. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Um, I, I would just like to uh, present to you uh, uh, an overview of what the PARI committee is, so that um, in, in a, a few minutes you will be able to understand what this experiment, uh, if we might call it that, um, entails and the power that it can bring to the table as we join forces between governmental and non-governmental sectors. Um, very briefly, in terms of organization, um, I'm sure Amadeus mentioned this before, so I will try to be very brief about it. Um, in January of this year, the governor of Puerto Rico signed the declaration of emergency due to the rise of gender case by, uh, violence in Puerto Rico. So, um, that executive order created the PARE committee. Uh, PARE uh, means stop as a word. Uh, the letters in this um, executive order mean prevention, prevención, apoyo, rescate, educación. Prevention, support, rescue, and education. Uh, the PARE committee has 19 members. 11 represent uh, government agencies or institutions. Five represent NGOs, non-governmental organizations. We have one compliance officer uh, that responds uh, and, and keeps the governor up to date as to the progress that we are making. One representative from the universities and academic circles and one representative from the news and media. Um, in terms of governmental representatives, as you can imagine, we have those that have the closest relationship in dealing with gender violence. Departments of Family, Health, Justice, Education, Housing, Economic Development, uh, Correction, the Police, obviously. We have the Women's Advocate Office, uh, forensic Science Institute, Statistics, and the Compliance Officer, um, whom uh, represents also the government. Uh, Non-governmental organizations, we have two here. Centro de la Mujer Dominicana, uh, represented by her Executive Director, Proyecto Madria, represented by her Executive Director. We also have Fundación Alas a la Mujer, which is a um, an NGO that um, specifically provides services in the central mountain part of the island, which is very important because, as you know, as it happens in the States, many times services and prevention efforts tend to navigate um, towards the major cities. And we forget that we have a lot of women in smaller communities, in rural communities, in mountain communities throughout the island that must be served as well. Uh, we also have the Red de Albergues de Violencia Domestica, which is the coalition of the eight different shelters for domestic violence that we have in Puerto Rico, 
who participate, and Coordinadora Paz para la Mujer, which is a, a, a very well-established coalition of organizations, of NGOs. Um, it, the coalition has over 30 members. So uh, we have a very healthy and very experienced group of people representing NGOs at the table. Um, the PARE committee members quickly realized that they needed to focus on specific strategies and they decided to organize 13 subcommittees. And there is a, a, there's a variety of topics that are priority. Um, if you excuse me, I'm going to... It's a little difficult with the microphone, sorry. Um, we have topics like public policy and legislation, services, sexual violence, uh, strategic alliances, community alliances, immigrants, resources, budget, etc. as part of the subcommittees that uh, work together with volunteers from different backgrounds and expertise and levels of expertise and bring proposals and bring recommendations to the whole of the committee. Um, sample a sample of the duties and responsibilities, just to give you a flavor of what the group does. Um, evaluation of an interagency action protocol for the intervention of violence against women in Puerto Rico. Um, celebration of public hearings. Uh, providing recommendations to the governor as to the signing or veto of a legislative bill that comes to his consideration. Um, review and establishment of agile processes for gender violence case management. Um, development of alliances to promote prevention and educational campaigns. Um, and, and then just to give you an example of things that are being uh, mandated by the executive order and are being worked on um, as we speak and for the past six months. Um, there is funding, uh, $6.8 million of the regular state budget that has been allocated to the committee to uh, implement the various initiatives that require that support, the fiscal support. And $4 million uh, that came from CRF, Coronavirus Relief Fund Act, um, to also support NGOs that have been dealing with the problem of uh, gender violence amidst the pandemic uh, caused by COVID. Um, Examples of some initiatives. Um, we are currently developing uh, the expansion of educational and training programs for several agencies in the government. Uh, Pedro Julio mentioned the police. Uh, this is an ongoing project. Um, history has great lessons, and we must learn them. It is our duty. Uh, I think training of police officers in Puerto Rico started loosely 25 years ago and we still talk about training. It is important that we address it and that we continue, that we continue to promote adequate training, retraining and continuous training. There are officers that join uh, the police department every year or a couple of years um, Pedro Julio mentioned something that's very important because it is a social phenomenon. Uh, as the LGBT community, as the women's movement gains prominence, homophobic people, misogyny starts to wind down because it is recognized in the society, in the community, that people are becoming empowered, that people are becoming educated. But as soon as it winds down, then posers, you know, hate comes back to the table. So training and education are fundamental to what we do. Uh, we have a project that already came out as a proposal from the PADEC committee to work with the public education system to institute uh, not as an initiative that will last six months or a year, but to institute as a policy the requirement of equity and gender education. It has to be at the table. 
it is the only way that we can prepare the next generations um, to really emphasize prevention at a mid or long term approach. Um, we have initiatives with the Department of Economic Development. Uh, we have initiatives with statistics, the Institute of Statistics. Um, I don't know if you have heard before, um, but one of the issues that we have had to deal with in Puerto Rico is information. How we collect statistics, data, information, uh, how do we validate it, how do we publish it, how can we um, uh, present factual, validated, and, and information that can be trusted. If you go to one government agency and find one set of statistics, and go to the next one and find different numbers, and go to the next one and find different numbers, you will never be able to truly understand what is actually happening out there in the streets. So that is one of the major initiatives that the PARE committee has been working with since day one, and we have made progress. But it is a long road, because it means that you have to go to every government agency and you have to rework the framework from which they have been operating not for 10 or 20 years but probably for 30, 40 years and with different uh, technology from one agency to the other. So it is a challenge. Um, I would like to speak a little bit about collaboration. Um, there have been various initiatives in Puerto Rico throughout the years. Um, our friends here can uh, talk maybe a little bit more about that. Um, but Puerto Rico's gender violence problem is not new. And, and we've had various efforts that have come along in the last probably 20 years or so. Uh, this scheme presented by the PARE committee, committee is, is a little bit different. Has other elements that were important and were missing from previous exercises. Um, I think uh, our friends will agree with me that one of the key issues is the assignment of a budget. You may have the best plans, the best ideas, the best people, but if you don't put your money where your mouth is, in government, specifically in government, it is very difficult. It is very hard. Bureaucracy will get in your way budget constraints and limits will prevent you from executing the, the great initiative, the great ideas. So uh, for the first time we have that on the table. Has it been easy? No. As, 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 as a group, government is uh, slow, bureaucratic, and is a, a little resistant to change. So it is an uphill battle, uh, but it is one that we have been addressing and in which we have been uh, gaining champions, gaining support in, in areas that might be surprising. Uh, I, I, I think Amarilis will enjoy this. Uh, this morning I, I received a message uh, from a guy who had called the office uh, because they needed some uh, uh, advice. Uh, on, on accessing social workers for this government agency. I, I can tell you the government agency, it's a, it's a, it's a good anecdote. Uh, Recreación y Deportes, okay? Sports and Recreation. So I called this guy back. I don't know who he is, just someone from this government agency. Uh, and I'm talking to him and I'm asking, what is it that you need, you know? Uh, in the Sports and Recreation Department, why, why do you need social workers, for what? Uh, explain it to me to see how we can assist you. Well, it turns out that I was speaking to the government head, to the secretary of uh, sports and recreation, and um, he has been uh, uh, on his own with his staff working to align his agency to the priorities established as public policy by the governor with this declaration of emergency. And he wants social workers because he wants to uh, strengthen 
his, uh, uh, the program that he has to support his employees at the government agency. Um, it's not that he's looking to hire social workers, but he wants to strengthen the programs that they have internally, and they would like to incorporate social workers, uh, uh, you know, just to have them available for employees uh, that, that may need them, that may need that support. So we ended up having a very nice chat, and we agreed uh, that we would coordinate a meeting to see how we can assist them and promote the things that he is doing. And he started telling me of all these initiatives, talk about training. Well, they have been training all these sports leagues and um, uh, 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 referees uh, and young groups of kids and public housing projects or different towns. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't know about it, but I I'm glad that we found out today because maybe now we can support him and promote what he's doing um, and, and at the same time, we can ensure that they have the correct approach, which is also very important. So, that kind of collaboration, be it spontaneous and voluntary, or because it is uh, a public policy mandate, is an essential tool for the party committee. Uh, and uh, we have been seeing some results. Uh, we already held seven public hearings, regional public hearings throughout the island. We had over, uh, I think, over 250 people that participated individually, organizations that went to the public hearings or sent information that wanted to be considered. We already had the first phase of a new dashboard for statistics on gender violence, and we have other initiatives related to that dashboard that will complement and lead us to a second phase of that statistics dashboard. We have various collaborative agreements with uh, organizations in the private sector that represent professional groups, and we have a few more coming along the way. We recently inaugurated the first um, protection orders operation and processing center. Uh, at the police headquarters. We had a few of those smaller models that were being very productive and very positive at the community level, at the municipal level. But we needed to bring a proven model that helps to ensure that protection orders uh, are more than a paper. We needed the police, uh, uh, um, the prosecutors, uh, people in the court system to understand that everybody has to be behind that order to make it work. So um, that will be very important. We will have the first statewide uh, uh, or island-wide registry for project protection orders and we will support that uh, with other services that are important, uh, security, uh, services, uh, uh, psychological services, social work services to the survivors of uh, gender violence so that we can then ensure that not only do they do their part in reporting the case, but that we make sure that we provide them with the necessary support to renew their lives and to work through that cycle of violence towards a, a more peaceful and safe environment. Um, and finally, just to mention a, a recent uh, uh, announcement, which is very important, on the topic of uh, sexual violence, which many times is left out of the equation. Uh, and we cannot forget that as important as dealing with domestic violence is, uh, we also have to maintain uh, the attention of everyone in the community on sexual violence. Uh, Yesterday, the Institute for Forensic Sciences, which is the arm that investigates and does uh, all the lab work, and autopsies in the investigations in Puerto Rico, um, announced that it had acquired uh, a rapid testing system for safe kits or rape kits that will allow them to process the backlog of rape kits that has not been tended to and will also allow them to uh, uh, work with new rape or safe kids as they come in, and they will be able to process that in, I think, 15 days or less, locally. 
that is a huge improvement. Uh, only two other states in the nation have that system. Puerto Rico became the third jurisdiction to have that rapid testing in place for rape kits. So, um, as you can imagine, for a victim of sexual violence, uh, this sends a powerful message. Uh, we are here to help. Allow us to assist you and to be with you in this process, but know that uh, different than at other times, uh, uh, you have this agency that is there to support you with the investigation that you need to decide if you want to proceed with your case at the court level, you know, with the prosecutors and such, or if not, at least to have the information to know that, in, that, that what was retrieved from your body as evidence has been treated correctly and respectfully for you. Um, so um, we have various campaigns as well, um, and I, I want to finish with this. We invite you to Google us up, Pare la Violencia, Stop the Violence, parelaviolencia.com. We have a website where you will find information. You will find our monthly uh, reports to the governor. Um, you will find samples uh, of the campaign that has been going on in government agencies. Uh, we have weekly campaigns uh, at the government level and we will go after municipalities and other organizations as well. We want everybody to join and continue, continue repeating the message. It is important, as Pedro Julio said before, and I reminded you, it, in Spanish we have a, a saying, uh, no puedes dejar caer la bolita. Okay? You can't let it drop. You must continue that messaging throughout all the stages of this committee or other groups' work because it sends a powerful message. And it is not just a matter of creating awareness or of just prevention. It, it impacts every aspect of the work that we do at the government level, at the organization's level, at the public policy level, or even when we come to forums like this. You have to know that this is important for Puerto Rico. And, and if you take home one message today, that should be it that in Puerto Rico there is a variety of people in government and non-governmental organizations that are working together, harmonizing differences and respecting their own differences, but working together for a common goal. And it can be done. Uh, we still have a lot to go. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, even with the daily frustrations that anyone encounters in their work uh, and in their causes, the ones that we believe deeply in, uh, we also have to take a moment and step back and recognize that we are moving forward and, and, and not let other issues that need to be addressed escape our attention. So uh, with that, I, I think hopefully you have an overview of what this collaboration this new paradigm um, is implementing, and we invite you to look us up in the web, and you will find a lot more information, and, and we can take questions later on if needed. Thank you.